Welcome to The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction, in which we look at the greatest and holiest writers from Catholic history. Join us as we explore the life and times in which they lived, an overview and study of their greatest works, and how we as Catholics can look to these masters as models for our own holiness on our journey to heaven. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are continuing our series on the spiritual masters featuring the great St. Augustine. And uh, we're here with my good friend, uh, Dr. Paul Thickpen. Thanks again for being here, Paul. Thank you for the invitation, Con. We've covered a lot. Um, we've been covering, kind of skimming the surface of some of his most important works, uh, uh, the Confessions, City of God, on Christian Doctrine, on the Trinity. And now we're just going to talk, we're going to bundle his sermons, his homilies together. And uh, let, it, let me start us off um, by saying just a couple points, and then I'd like you to talk about your experience with his sermons, because I know you have a love and affection for them. Um, he started preaching as a young priest, he, uh, which was uncommon. Uh, mostly it was reserved for uh, uh, bishops, but he was such a great speaker and so renowned already. He got a lot of preaching in um, early on. Uh, he followed the liturgical calendar. That's one thing I read that's kind of significant. But he um, – and, oh, this is an interesting thing. So, like, he would have a, a scripture passage, a gospel reading most likely, that he – that was kind of like the passage for that Sunday or that week. But he would actually preach on that maybe four times in the same week, which is an it's different than we have, you know. And so that enabled – I can imagine – it was like just droves of people coming in mm -hmm. to hear the same message throughout the week. That's kind of an interesting thing for me. Um, people took shorthand. He had scribes sitting in there, and so that's one way that we we have all of this. Many of those survive. We have four to 500 sermons, and that equals up to about 1.5 million words. And you mentioned there's about 5.5 million words of Augustine total. But 1.5 are, are, are sermons. And somebody estimated that he preached about 8,000 times in his life, mm. which is an unbelievable number. Some homilies were very long. One homily was 1,500 lines long, which translates into a two-and-a-half-hour preaching. Augustine was Pentecostal? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. I can say that as a former Pentecostal. Yes, he was. We would preach on for hours sometimes. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Yep. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, that's just kind of an overview of the quantity that this guy did. I didn't say anything about the quality. <laughs> I just said the quantity. So why do you love the sermons? What do they say to you? Why do you appreciate them so much? Because as soon as we start talking about doing this podcast on him, you jumped all over the sermons. Yeah. Well, it's, it's easy if you read his theological and philosophical essays to, to just picture him as this very abstract thinking, kind of high level thinking person. And he, and he was. But it was when I got to his sermons when I said, oh, my goodness. He's, um, these are all the same tr truths, and, but he's putting in a way that everyday people can understand them. And he's doing it in a very delightful way. Um, the, that Northern African culture, um, they, they loved wit and they loved colorful stuff and, and imagery and analogies and anecdotes and stories. And he, he was drawing on his, his native culture when he did that. And um, it's interesting. I, I'll just, as a side note, have a dear friend, uh, a father, Valerie Akko, who's uh, from Cameroon. He's um, from Africa, you know, further down the continent. But one of the things I noticed about him when I first met him was um, that he, his, his everyday sermons, especially to children, were just excellent, really theologically formed. And I'm thinking – Boy, Augustine could have said that, that kind of stuff. Hmm. Then I had my first theological discussion with him back. What have you been reading, Father? And he'd been reading Augustine and all these other great things. And what he had the same gift of being able to take these very deep, profound insights and put them in such a way, not dumbing them down, but making them concrete, making them vis vivid, making giving them a narrative, uh, bringing personal experience to bear on it and other people's experience. And that's what you see in Augustine, and that's what's so so lovely about it. It's the kind of thing that every writer, you know, I'm a writer, I would love to be able to do it as well as he does. And uh, a lot of his imagery was homespun. So uh, I've got one I want to read at some point where he he's talking about the fear of God and the love of God. 
And the analogy he gives is a is a needle with thread sewing through a piece of cloth. Really? Every every you know every person that ever had to do that would would recognize uh, what he's talking about. So it's beautiful. The fear of God prepares a place for love. But once love has begun to dwell in our hearts, the fear that prepared the place for it is driven out. As the one increases, the other decreases. And the more love fills us, the less place there is for fear. Greater love, less fear. Greater fear, less love. But if there is no fear at all, there is no way for love to come in. As we can see in sewing, the needle introduces the thread into the cloth. The needle goes in, but the thread cannot follow unless the needle comes out first. In the same way, the fear of God first occupies our minds, but it does not remain there because it enters only in order to introduce love. Wow. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. So that it was so you And the fear of God hurts a little bit. It hurts. Like that it hurts, but through. it has to prepare a place in our minds. And it carries in its train the love. And once you've made the place you needed and the love is in place, you take the needle away. What a you know, it's brilliant. It's, it's brilliant. It's just brilliant. It's, and think how many women, especially in that day, would have probably done most of the sewing. You know, they're just thinking. Oh yeah, I know all about that, and 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 the needle hurts sometimes. You know, I could just hear him thinking about it and drawing all kinds of wow. lessons from and it. And he did it every day. I mean, yep. just all yeah. the time, all yeah. the time. One of the things, uh, Paul, that I've latched onto in my research is that he he gave sermons on all 150 Psalms. Yeah, and in the, the 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 biography I read on him <laughs> told me that that Augustine referred to the Psalms as the emotions of Christ. Mm. What do you think he meant by that? That's powerful language. That's a, that's an imagery that I need to like, you know, meditate on. Mm, mm. And we know David, you know, was so much was pre pre Christ kind of figure and <laughs> metaphor or whatever you want to call it. But the the Psalms are the emotions of Christ. Help, help me understand that. Well, wow. well, first of all, I want to say that that uh, Saint Athanasius had written an essay on the Psalms, and he called the Psalms the mirror of the soul. Hmm. So, in general, of the human soul, you he say, if if you're feeling sad, here's a psalm. Read that, and it'll reflect and help you understand what you're going through. Here's, are you afraid? Here's one. Are you angry? Here's one. And so, I, I see Augustine kind of taking that. I don't know if you read that, probably um, taking it a step further and saying, okay, um, Christ was kind of the perfect human, right? not kind of, he was the perfect human, and uh, not that he would have necessarily wanted to bash babies against the rock, like one of the psalmists says. But um, if this really is like a mirror of the soul, it's probably a mirror of Christ's soul, or he illustrates it in, in such a beautiful way. And um, I think we have to keep in mind, too, that, that Augustine taught specifically at one point when people had the, uh, the question of, why would Jesus say on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because had the Father really abandoned him? And some people said yes. But what, what he said was that Christ is the head of the body, and the head speaks for the body, you know, and we're the body. And we ourselves have that place where we feel like God has abandoned us. Mm. And so we cry out that when he is crying out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned, forsaken me? He's doing it on our behalf. Mm. He has taken up our voice because he's taking on our sin. And I think that's a great example of what he's talking about, that that's a psalm that comes from a psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's from one of the psalms. David had said it, but it isn't a human cry. And now Christ has taken that human cry and made it his own on our behalf. He knows he's not abandoned by the Father, but he's speaking on our behalf as our representative, as Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us. He is our representative. And then you can take that in so many ways then. Um, and all of the rest of it, too, is that if you read the rest of the psalm, it doesn't end with, why have you abandoned me? It ends up in, a, in, in words of praise. Yes. And um, there's a good chance that he actually said the rest of the psalm while he was there. We only got the first words. They sometimes would do that when reporting um, what he'd said. So I think that's a good example of what we're talking about. Yeah. Christ is the head speaking for the body in many ways. And in the psalms, we see see that in a beautiful way. So Augustine had a, I'm sure he delivered a lot of, well, he gave 
so at least 150 uh, sermons on the Psalms and probably more. Um, I think he saw that, again, the body of Christ, right? The, the Psalm spoke to the emotions of every, every, the everyday man, all the normal things that men and women were going through, all the emotions, all the life experience. It's, it's embedded in the mm-hmm. Psalms. So he, he believed that he could bring language, his own language, his own imagery and allegory that these African uh, population could understand, his, uh, his parishioners, I guess you call them. And he wanted to connect his eloquence, his metaphor, with the emotions of Christ that are found in the Psalms. And so I can just imagine, you know, sitting there and listening, listening to him, him speak the Psalms. Um, I think in his in his song uh, in his sermons more than his theological treatises, treatises, you can find a playful language, uh, you know, more brilliant imagery. Um, because he is speaking to the average person, like you're mm-hmm. saying. So, you know, um, this was, I guess, the ultimate use of his rhetorical skills. I read that he used Latin puns to help things stick in the memory. So he just he just seems the complete opposite of a stuck up academic. You know, <laughs> yeah. he he just seems to me to be such a a down to earth pastor, like a pastoral father to his flock, especially in times of difficulties. Mm-hmm. You know, when the vandals are besieging Hippo, he gives homilies on perseverance, preparing yourself to Christ will give you the grace to survive persecution. You know, so. He's just a loving father preaching to his people, and I suspect you can see that throughout his sermons pretty clearly. You can. I think about. Let me see if I can find this one quickly. Um, he would speak to the people about their the adversity in their lives, and if they were to question why God isn't answering a prayer the way they want, or questioning why God is allowing this adversity, then he would give them these these beautiful analogies. Um, so here's one where he compares. He compares the Lord to a physician, right? Which is the our Lord's physician. own, yeah, it's a biblical image. We must understand then that even though God does not always give us what we want, he gives us what we need for our salvation. Suppose you ask a physician for something that would be harmful, and he knows it would be harmful. What should he do? Let's say you ask for a drink of cold water. If it would do you good and he gives it to you right away, then surely you cannot say that he has not heard you. On the other hand, if it would do you harm, and so he does not give it to you, you still cannot say that he has not heard you just because he contradicted your will. Instead, he has heard you for the sake of your help. The divine physician. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. And he talks, too, about how when God comes after us with the, the scalpel, or even he talks sometimes about the um, – and cauterization of a wound, which is you know a horrible thing. They would take a piece of metal and get it glowing red. They didn't know about germs, but they knew if you left it, it would go to gangrene, so press it against the wound. And he uses that that strong imagery. <clears throat> Anybody who'd been through it would know exactly what he's talking about. And and he says, um, you you just got to trust the doctor that he knows what's going to be best for you. You can't really tell the doctor how to how to treat you because because you don't. Uh, but again and again, when the adversity comes, you just have to say, I, I, I trust the doctor. He knows what he's doing. The divine physician analogy is incredible, and I'm glad he he uses it because uh, a lot of a lot of people after him use this analogy. Mm-hmm. And uh, our little book, Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence, a great mm-hmm. little tan book, you know, it talks a lot about this. And it quotes Augustine, I think, on um, – I know it quotes him a ton on – Divine Providence, because he's got so much to say about it. But I think he he quotes him in regards to this divine physician. But think about this, Paul. I mean, we pay doctors to hurt us in, <laughs> exactly. in order to bring a healing. <laughs> you know, I mean, we want them. We pay that we they 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 um they cut into us with a knife uh, to fix something. And we pay them money and say thank you. Mm-hmm. And he, I guess it you says know. that. That's exactly what he says. Yeah. But what do we do with God? You know, <laughs> He's the divine physician, and he sends uh, pain and suffering our way for our own salvation, and we get angry at him. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful analogy. The, the divine physician works really well. That's, I mean, this, this, he probably got the words that you were reading. But they, they also come from, from the sermons here. He, he'll even talk about how the, um, when the doctor has to do things that hurts you, you know, you, you don't say, oh, the doctor hates me. No, because he doesn't hate you. He hates the disease mm. because he loves you. Mm. Such a 
beautiful thing to remember that if he's giving you the adversity, it's something he's or allowing it, something you need, and it's because he hates the disease in your soul, so to speak. Yeah, right? yeah. The brokenness there, and he he loves you, so he wants you to be healed. Yeah. He doesn't hate you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I I need to spend more times with the sermons, you know, mm. and I think that I. You know, I think the one place that I did experience them a good bit is in the Liturgy of the Hours. I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of excerpts, you know, in the daily readings. Um, um, there's there's a, quite a lot of references. Uh, what's it's not Liturgy of the Hours. What's the part in the back when they, um, you know, the the daily yes, the, the extra readings that go along <laughs> yeah, with the Liturgy yeah, of the yeah. Hours? Why am I forgetting? Anyway, um, and so it's you know there's a, quite a lot of passages from from Augustine, from his sermons, because they're just fitting for every day of the year, you can find something. So maybe Tan needs to publish more on the sermons of mm -hmm. St. Augustine. You know, maybe we'll consider that. But um, in our next episode, Paul, we're going to wrap it up. It'll be our conclusory episode, and we're going to talk about how St. Augustine, after everything we've said, and everything we've discussed, and everything he did, how he's a model for us becoming a saint. Um, but it's probably best seen in in his sermons because that's when he's really mm -hmm. trying to help mm -hmm. his parishioners his flock be saintly um but thank you for this episode and um any last any last thoughts on the on the sermons any advice you give to our listeners before we conclude read them yeah, you, can, you can get them online the translations are often old but even if you just take one at a time they're, they're, they're small most of them, not the one you talked yeah, about, right. that was but the most of them, you, you take them and just let the let the image he uses, the analogy, whatever, just sink into sink yourself. In. Yeah. All right. God bless you, Paul. Thanks for being here. God bless you, Connor. Thank you. This has been an episode of The Spiritual Masters, a podcast brought to you by TAN. To follow the show, learn about more inspiring holy men and women, and to support The Spiritual Masters and other great free content from TAN. Visit spiritualmasterspodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code MASTERS25 to get 25% off your next order, including works by St. Augustine and countless more spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. And thanks for listening.